far. Yeah, yeah. So they will at this time. Joshua, bruise over all. Give whatever the Father put on his heart to do. Uh, we were at the beach the other day, and when we were at the beach, I was sitting at the beach, and it had this little quote, and it says, The kingdom come, a helping hand for Bible students. And I didn't know what it was at the time, and the Father just told me just get that book. I said, It's kind of just different. It doesn't look like much. I paid a dollar for it. You know, but the Father told me to get it, and have a uh, the experience with him when I go to certain places he's telling me to get certain things and most of the time I don't know what it's for until later on. Well this book was written in 1891. Okay, and I bought it for a dollar. And uh, the man who uh, who wrote this book, he, he did a scholarly search. I'm sure some, some of us have uh, have looked into the, the Giza Pyramid. And there was some stuff that uh, me and Shepard John were going over with uh, Fibonacci and uh, Pi and Pi and some other things were going on with the mathematics that were found there and other places. But there's something that this man took 30, almost 30 years to research. He was actually there. He did measurements and he ran the measurements with numbers there from prophecy. And he ran them through scriptures. He ran them with the line of the stars at the time that this was, uh, should have been built. And uh, he's a Christian, a uh, Christian of a long time ago. And so there's something that I read, I read to more than half this book, as you can see. And I was like, okay, Father, okay, it's really good, interesting stuff. And there's some things that started to come up. He started talking about foundation stones. He said, one thing you, that you have to understand about the, the, this great pyramid, that it has five foundation stones. One by went, wow, four, it's right there. And he starts speaking of uh, the kingly chamber and how the, there's a measurement of a, a place there that matches the Ark of the Covenant. Exactly. And then there's a prophecy that was given um, that the Father gave in Isaiah, Isaiah 1919 uh, about building this pyramid in the midst and on the water. It seems kind of weird. How can you build something in the middle and uh, on, uh, on the water at the same time? There's some uh, great teachings to that. But this man brings out this. I'm, gonna read, I'm just going to read uh, what he says. And so um, uh, I realize this is written by a Christian back in, was it 1891 I said? It, it said this is some, uh, it just, when I got to this I had to just stop and just like, oh wow Father, now I understand why you brought this book uh, to me. It always brings things to me. It says, uh, the conclusion of proof, uh, this is what uh, the name is. As to the date of the Great Pyramid building was most abundantly corrupted uh, later by certain measurements by which the Great Pyramid indicates its own date of construction. So he's saying that the pyramid actually dates itself. The man doesn't even date. There's certain things that he's finding out that it's, uh, it's dating. It says, a realization of the fact that the Great Pyramid exhibits a wisdom of design which the Egyptians could not have possessed. The divine wisdom which must have been worked out under the uh, supervision of some inspired servant of God uh, has led to conjecture that the Malchizedek was its builder. Oh. Oh. 1891, yeah. Christian man, mm -hmm. he comes to the, the, the great amount of mathematics mm. and the high uh, amount of architecture that had to be done that was surpassed everything that had on the face of this earth at the time that this was built. He says there's only one that could have built this and it was the Melchizedek at the time. Hallelujah. Uh, we're all a little over here in 2016, barely walking in the understanding of what uh, Melchizedek is. <laughs> yes, it was not. He had a glimpse of this way back in 1894. I said, Father, this book is a treasure. And there's some things here that he pulls out. I mean, he says, uh, He was a king of Salem. That's, that is the king of priests, a priest of the Most High God. And a person and a type occupied so high a position as to be a blesser of Abraham, who also paid in tithes. Of this we can know little except that Melchizedek was a great and peaceful king, and that he lived out the time and not far distant from the site of the Great Pyramid. So it proved that he actually lived near the site where this was built. And he goes on, I'll, I'll paraphrase, it's a lot of reading. 
But he, par he goes on and says that he was a king over a great nation, and the tribes and the warriors that he had superseded everyone. The only one that came close to him was Abraham and his men. But he went in at a time, this Mount Pesetic went into Egypt and took over peacefully. Nobody dared raise war against him. And they Joseph? came in and they did something in, and, and for, uh, they came in for a very small time. They came into Egypt, took over the power, they built this pyramid and then they left in peace. Uh -huh. and what they had to do was they had to fulfill what the Father had asked them to do. And they built this thing in the border and in the midst of Egypt. And to understand that, how do you build something in the midst of something and then on its border at the same time? Mm -hmm. But if you understand how Egypt was at the time that this Mephazetic existed, yeah. uh, Egypt was split in half. It had a southern and northern kingdom just like Israel mm -hmm. did at one time. And so the border between these two halves was right in the midst. So right in the midst between these two southern and uh, northern half of Egypt was where this pyramid was built. So it was built on the border, yet in the midst of Egypt. And so the, the uh, prophecies that, and uh, um, certain things that are written in this book, he pulls out from the, uh, the measurements and the place and the time of the stars and the constellations where they were when this was built. It points to certain things that would happen in Bethlehem at a certain time and a certain king would be born. There's some things in this book, I was like, oh man, I'm getting excited. <laughs> this wasn't an Egyptian creation. It wasn't, uh, we, this man proves that it had to be the Mount at the time that built this. And he just goes on and on and on. And he, he has maps and uh, maps of the stars. He has awesome in-depth history. The findings that he finds in there, uh, the way it's built, why there's nothing on the walls, what you have to do, the ascension and the descension you have to do to get into the king's room. Yeah. It's really awesome. Uh, not you not really not have to crawl to get into this not space. Not and there's some the mathematics that are uh, flown there, the geometry that's there. Uh, the quantum physics that's found is, is, is mind-boggling. Yeah. The symmetry of uh, like precision is beyond uh, our spatial. Mm. We can't duplicate what they, what they did. And it's a, it's, mm. it's a fingerprint of Yah saying that I was there from the beginning mm -hmm. and my Melchizedek was there and you will rule reign even in the end. So that's, mm. that's what the Father gave to me. <laughs> and and uh, I just wanted to say sometimes you might just look at something and say, a dollar? Mm. What's the value in that? Value in it. And um, I have many, many gifts that the Father has given me. And it's either cost me very little or it's cost me nothing. And so value the things that might not seem of value in your life and look for the Father in it because He brought it to you for a reason. And sometimes it might be hardships. Sometimes it might be um, a mouth of somebody that's on you. There's something to be learned, something to be gained by it. And you just have to value everything. You know, Namzala told that this too is for the good. Whether it be good, whether it be evil or bad, or however you want to look at it, mm -hmm. nothing comes into our life unless the Father allows it. There's a reason for us to accept the things He gives, embrace the hard times, embrace the suffering, and there's some things that we've been studying, and I call like, oh, Father, there's some things you need to start embracing. And once we, you embrace the things and the challenges that come at you, you become the victor, you become the champion. And we give all praise and glory to our Father. Amen. We worship and praise Him. And we worship and praise Him even in our trials and even in our pain and our suffering. And the rest of the nations will look and say, well, who is this regular people? Mm -hmm. And even in their suffering, they can still praise their Father. Thank you. Yeah, no worries. Hallelujah. We have a little bit to share. We're excited about it. We have some other things that are coming up. Some really, yeah, really wow. awesome studies that, that we're uh, just looking at. My mind's getting tossed everywhere. And uh, man, the Father's getting ready to move. There's some things he's starting to uncover. There's some things he's starting to download into his people. And I'm getting excited. I've, I've had two hours of sleep, and I feel like I'm just refreshed. <laughs> I, I can't explain it, but I just know when you start meditating upon the things that the Father has given you, mm. and I say you are us, you can't help but get excited and rejuvenated. It's a strength and a power and a peace beyond, beyond all understanding, and it can only be explained that we are connected to Him and us, Him and the us together. Mm. You know, Yahushua has said what? I pray that you shall become with, one with me as I am one with the Father. So we shall all be the walking God and be connected to one another. Uh, I was just reading up on some things. Uh, Shem, 
which is known as the Melech Sadiq that came mm -hmm. to Abraham, he was actually in Egypt ruling and reigning during that time and there's always been a battle with those who were in Egypt under that order of Melchizedek against the Kushites. So we see there's this interesting thing going on even during the time that we're living in. I, I'm not like really fascinated with that. My mind's already going and we are uh, preparing to uh, reveal some interesting teachings you probably have not heard ever. And uh, it's going to be mind-blowing and it's going to be fortifying for the foundation of our faith. And we need to stay excited and keep pressing into the truth of the scriptures because the time of religious lies is coming to an end. And uh, we, a lot of us have come through a mixed doorway of religion with the sole purpose of pressing towards our Master Messiah. And Abba knows how to bring out that which belongs to Him without any other involvement of the filth of, of religion. So get ready, you guys. I'm excited. And it's no coincidence that uh, we are starting to understand the difference between legal and lawful realms. The Melech Sadiq order is a lawful realm of kings. It's a kingdom of priests which operate from a kingdom above this worldly system. Um, and the, I don't want to give away too much, but as we've mentioned before, that site where the Temple Mount is at, where the Dome of the Rock is at, there is 100% proof, evidence that that is not the Temple um, mm -hmm. yep. of our Master That's whatsoever. Right. There's there's a lot. Of, uh, I'm, I'm putting some things together. I know Shepherd John's putting some stuff together. A lot of you are researching some things. Uh, there's a whole lot of shaking about to go yeah. on. <laughs> And uh, a lot of rejelling. And we need to encourage our Messianic Hebrew roots. Uh, I know a few of the Black Israelite uh, movement uh, leaders, captains, they call themselves, and I know a couple of them. Uh, we need to keep them in prayer because their, the entire mindset is going to be rocked and shaped and shifted for the better because the Mashiach is coming. Where the Dome of the Rock is, I don't know if, how many people have done the research on, on uh, and, and read up on those types of things, probably several of you have. Uh, in that area, there's an imprint of Muhammad's horse. Did you guys know that? Wow. And the name of Muhammad's horse is called Barak. <laughs> so, not to accuse, but it's really no. interesting how our Creator has an amazing sense of humor with history and the choices that people make. In His sovereignty, He moves things around strategically because in the end, His name will be glorified to the most magnificent yeah. level ever. Yeah. And we can enjoy that. So there's a lot of powerful things happening. The Father has raised up men to do research on one thing here, one thing here. They spend their whole life uh, and, and, and almost to the death of the of their time of research to give us the tools that we need for this time. As the book of Enoch, Enoch had said during that generation that he was speaking to, he says, your generation is not going to understand these mysteries. Mm -hmm. These were these are being held for an end time generation. They will begin to understand and begin to be given back these powerful things that were written in the sky. So we're starting to understand this, and uh, I know we are getting, uh, uh, when I say we as a congregation, uh, myself even targeted, and many of you might have been uh, targeted already uh, uh, because of the flow that we're going in. But stay encouraged, yeah. and uh, there's a lot of amazing things I, I'm trying to hold back. Uh, going on, okay. So um, at this time, we have a couple baskets that take them up. We want to be a blessing financially. Well, we're more than uh, excited to accept that. Your, your, your offering, you want to give a tithe, that, that's fine as well. Um, while the brothers are doing that, we have a couple announcements. Okay, um, this month we have a couple of uh, upcoming events. 
the second Sunday, um, we do the outreach for the homeless. We go out and feed them. Uh, I don't think Lisa's here yet. Uh, also, the Tour 101 class will start July 18th. Those will be on Monday nights for 10 weeks. If you'd like to uh, sign up or join that class, please see Rachel. She's in the kitchen right now. Uh, the fee for that is due by July 9th. It's a $65 fee. We're taking checks and money orders, no cash, and it's a non-refundable fee. Uh, July 29th, Joseph Israel. Yeah! He'll be here with us. Hallelujah. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Say the best for last, huh? So at this time, our, our youth can go to class, and our young ones can go to class as well. Enjoy your time of learning. How many uh, how many little ones are here today? Raise your hand. Little ones, but powerful ones, right? Dynamite comes Come on. Yes. That's right. That's right. Dynamite comes in small packages. <laughs> so grown-ups are saying, wait, I'm a little one too. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Open up with the show for us. That's right. Oh, come on now. Show for us. Hey, get your show for us, brother. Show for us so good. <laughs> And, uh, and if you don't have a uh, uh, horn like this, you got your Tarula yeah. here. That's what brings the walls of Jericho down. Right. That Tarula. shifted it doesn't line up the way I did it and it's like really disappointing and I don't know why that happens so I want to encourage you guys if you have a little memory stick bring that it'd be a lot better so that you could see the tour portion on the PowerPoint how it was originally put together because the emails it just it messes it up uh, stuff's not lined up it's to the right everything's all screwed up you know with this placement and it, I saw that I was like oh my gosh this is not even this is kind of dumb it doesn't even you know excuse me but people that know he were going to look at that and say man this guy what is he doing look at this stuff's all up well points are all everywhere and the words aren't lining up so I just re realized that recently so um, if you want an email, you can have it, but just know it's going to be um, uh, out of place almost everywhere. And I encourage you guys to get the uh, memory stick, all right? So um, uh, enough said, and I think we uh, said everything we needed to say. I'm going to look at the time because we are on a schedule. Where yes, Molly?
We have plans, and he, he likes to shift things around, and uh, we'll see why today, okay? So let's uh, say this together from right to left. I want to hear you guys say it. God, I ain't babita if la thought me toratecha. Unveil my eyes so that I might hold the whole wonderful signs. All right, you asked for it. You, you asked. Unveil yeah. Eyes. Okay, so you asked for it. Next one, right to left. Odekia alki norot nifleti niflai maeshita ba neshi ya doat meod. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your words, my soul knows it very well. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Better know it, right? Thank you, Father. We better know it. Our soul better know it very, very well. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 37 to 38 says this. And I will cause you to pass under the rod. And I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. Yeah. And I will purge out from among you the rebels. Mm. All the rebels. Mm. Mm. And those who disobey against me, and I will bring them forth out of the land where they live, but they shall not enter into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am yod heh vav -Heh. He says, you will know that I am the name yod Hey, wow, hey, yo, hey, Bob, hey. Come on. In Torah portion Shalach Lecha, we had the uh, the spies, right? Which were really not spies. They were to go and observe and discern the goodness of the mm -hmm. land. And 10 of the individuals that went, mm -hmm. went and were distracted because of fear. And when you look at those things in front of you that are subject to change, if you look at them long enough through the eyes of your flesh, you just might become a fearful person of those things. And the Father has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a disciplined mind, a focused mindset. So we need to understand that He has not raised up the people to fear the world. We're to fear Him, even if it's at the expense of your life, no matter what. We're to fear Him to walk in all of His ways, period. No ifs, ands, buts about it. He's not winking at little babies. He's winked in the beginning because of ignorance. But as we begin to walk his Torah out, he, do, he no longer winks. Even in a generational, uh, on a generational level, he's not winking, I believe, not anymore. So it's time for us to walk up brightly. But we see this, the spies go in. And because of this fear that went in, that Torah portion, Shalach Lecha, uh, is the one that reveals to us why that generation is going to die in the wilderness. So what would have just been a few days, they're at the edge, at the brink of entering the promised land. Now they're going to be in the wilderness another almost 38 years. And every one of that generation would wind up dying off. And the little ones that were there would wind up taking the testimony of the Most High into the promised land and live in that promised land. And we know later on, rebellion was going to set in again. It's just like this rebellious thing that's there that needs to be brought out. But that's pretty much the, the main thrust of, of Shalak Lecha. But we're going to go a different direction with this week's Torah portion, Korach. Say Korach. 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 And here's a basic outline for you guys to look at uh, with uh, Korach. Uh, the details in here are, are pretty amazing. Is the air on? It's kind of warm in here, huh? I'm you guys can turn that fan on low. I'll try to talk loud. I'll be able to talk about that fan. How many fans are in this room? We just got the one, right? And then so many. Of you are <laughs> I hope I'm, you're not a fan of me. I don't. I, no. Fan of the Torah. Fan yeah. Of our Mashiach. Fan of the Ahushua. But Korah's rebellion in this one is also the main thrust of the Torah portion. We're going to look at some things here. The main theme of this parsha is rebellion. Rebellion, the scripture says, is as the, the sin of witchcraft. 
Mm. So it's like witchcraft when one rebels against the instruction, regardless of how the individual feels, it's witchcraft in the eyes of Yahweh. So you have a lot of religiosity in the world today teaching a lot of emotionalism that is square in the face of his covenant and his Torah rebelling. That's called witchcraft, period, according to the scriptures. So we see this main thrust is rebellion. Within this portion, we have the message of actual hope and restoration. How do we know that? If you begin to read Psalm 40, excuse me, Psalm 44, uh, 42, 44 to 49, uh, 87 to 88. There's several psalms that were written by the sons of Korah. Mm -hmm. So even though Korah was judged, there was a, 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 a generation of Korah that would wind up being preserved. And what do you know? Samuel, the prophet, comes from the lineage of Korah. Uh -huh. Very interesting. So yeah. you see how the, the master hand is always moving in the midst of all the chaos and even in the midst of rebellion he knows how to get in and still raise up somebody to bring about the glory of his powerful and his mighty name we see Korah will rebel but centuries later we have the powerful sons that i just mentioned with the generation seed sons of, of Korah this should minister to each and every one of us in this room all of us because our fathers physical fathers and ancestral uh, Israelites they rebelled and they sinned even our daddies today and our grandfathers this generation now so yes we've come out of a generational iniquity bondage and yet we still see some of the generational iniquity that rises up in our life as Torah pursuant believers in the master himself. And yet we still see generational iniquity popping its ugly little head up. Because the Torah, we need to have the Torah take residence deep down on the inside of us. And that's a lifelong process. According to Vaikra, Leviticus 26, verse 40 to 20, 40 to 41. Excuse me. I put 40 to 21. If you read it backwards, it's right to left. So in Hebrew, right to left. It says, if we confess the sins and transgression of our forefathers, there's forgiveness in those verses there. We can move past the mistakes of our ancestors of the flesh which we're actually transitioning from a whole lot of stuff, even in this country. You have many people who are stuck on, and it's true, to a certain degree, there's some truth there. This country was found on the principles of Scripture. There's a truth to that, but that's not 100% accurate. Because it was also not only founded on, on scriptural principles, but it was mixed still with the hand of Freemasonry and all these other things. So we have to repent even from that because of forefathers here. But guess what? This is not our homeland. We're just passing through, as we said before. Our homeland is Israel. That's our inheritance. Wow. Unless you claim to be a Levite today, if you claim to be a modern-day Levite, then the land of Israel is not your inheritance. Yah is your inheritance, and the tithes of Israel is your inheritance according to the Torah. But the land inheritance is for the 12 tribes of Israel. So this message of hope, this is a message of hope, this Torah portion, believe it or not, even though as we will see in the beginning of this Torah portion, it seems hopeless because of the rebellion of Korah. This is why you got to be very wise and careful of who you camp next to. You got to be careful who you camp next to. Just ask Korah, ask the Reubenites. The Kohathites, all, all of them, ask them. If you were to hear them today, as some rabbis, they, they get on the... I think there was a rabbi doing this Torah portion, he put his ear on the ground and everybody's watching him. And they're asking him, what are you doing? He's all, shh. I can hear Korah saying, listen to Moses, otherwise you end up where we're at. I don't know how true that is. But the principle of it is, listen to the writings of Moses. Why? The Messiah said the same thing. That if you would have believed Moses, you would have believed him. 
He says, because Moses, what he wrote was about me. So if you believe Moshe, then you believe the words of the Mashiach because the, the Torah is written about the Mashiach. And you know what? I'm really, really debating within myself to put something out in this whole region in Uptown Whittier. Because you have a lot of brothers and sisters in the churches surrounding that are hungry for more than the Sunday service. So I'm real challenged to put something out to the surrounding pastors, and I know a lot of them here, to personally ask them. Some might say, nah, we shouldn't have to do that. Yeah, we're supposed to debate the Word of God with those who are speaking contrary to what is written for the sake of the sheep. So I'm really thinking about it. The Father has to really work on me to put something out, a challenge to the religious men here. Let's have a public debate pertaining to the truth of Scripture for the sake of the sheepfold that none of us own. We don't own sheep. So I'm really challenging myself with that. And the Father has to make sure there's not any flesh in me uh, whatsoever because we're all human beings, right? And we all struggle with our flesh. And I get, like I said, my blood is is simmering like some of yours all the time. You know, all the time, there, some of you, if you're Puerto Rican, if you're from Brazil, if you're, you know, Hispanic, or you just had a hard life, you know, your, your blood's going to be simmering depending on what you been through and where you come from so I have to make sure that doesn't get and interfere with righteous things but I'm tired of, of the sheep of Yah being lied to the father said in the book of Ezekiel he says I will raise up shepherds after my heart and the heart of the father will be according to his covenant Torah so when a shepherd sees a wolf in sheep's clothing luring the sheep away that shepherd wants to get that staff and bash that wolf right in the head. Some of you might be thinking, is he saying to get a stick and start beating up those? No, I'm not saying that, but you get the shepherd's staff, which is the Torah, and you begin to crush the manipulating mindset of religion that has lured the sheep of Yah into places of darkness. And that's what we need to do. Sorry if I'm making you very quiet. But look at this. This is the 38th Torah portion. It is also from this point on that the sons and daughters of Israel will spend another 38 years in the wilderness. Imagine that. All in the same vicinity. 38 years. Rebellion was the result of Korah coveting the priesthood. Period. Chapter 16, verse 10. All because he wanted the priesthood. Last week's Torah portion ends with the Sitziot, the blue, and some of the tradition is that Korah, when he came with all these guys, they were dressed in all blue, making a public statement of what they desired and what he truly wanted to do. Rebellion is Mari in Hebrew, which means rebellion, bitterness. If we were to read this in reverse, look at this. We have pictures which say this, and the word for rebellion, and this is why the Hebrew is so beautiful when you study every letter, you have the hand raised up against the head. And what happened with the man with the sticks, picking up sticks on Shabbat, he was to be stoned? It's beyad rama in Hebrew, which means to raise your fist up like this. In other words, challenging the Almighty. I'm going to do what I want to do. And there's some amazing teachings with that man who was put to death. And later on, the daughters that come to Moses saying, You know what? Shall we not have part of the inheritance because of the sin of our father in the wilderness? Well, the hint is, is the man who raised his hands, the little girls were those women that would come to Moses later on. They remembered when their father was put to death for raising his fist in the face of Yah. We're not supposed to raise our fist. We're to have open hands before Him showing that I surrender all to you, everything. And I depend completely upon you for all substance and sustenance in my life. But another raised hand like last week or last Torah portion, which is this Torah, Shalach Lecha, 
Beyad Ramah, raising the fist in the face. So notice there were also 250 men, remember? Each one was judged according. 250 men that stand with the rebellion. And you know what? We have set Torah portions that the rabbis have given, right? The yearly, the three year. But you know what? You gotta always be on guard. Because we just might be shifting things around as we're walking this out like we did this week. But look at this, Johnny and Bernie, who, who love studying and bringing out the paleo, let's look at what the paleo pictograph says with the, with the Torah portion, and I didn't put it up here. I think I mixed it up because of this, this new insight that I have from Shepherd John. I messed it up, it's probably gonna pop up. But anyways, I will probably get to it, maybe, maybe. There's also 94 verses in this Torah portion in which the main thrust is dealing with rebellion. 94 happens to be the same number for another Hebrew word, Ha'ayim, which means the birds of prey found in Genesis 15:11, where Abram drives the birds of prey from the divided pieces of the blood ratified covenant that Yah was making with him, in which we are in. Korah is just like those ravenous birds that are always trying to usurp the authority of covenant standard, trying to usurp the authority of appointed leadership that the Father gives. And that happens. Usually with Torah portion Korah, one of the reasons why I said, you know, this might be one of the reasons why we'll do this one, because it seems like almost every year when we would do Torah portion Korah, that some form of rebellion would rise up somewhere in the congregation. I said, no, maybe we do it before, it won't happen. <laughs> but the Father's been doing some cleaning house, as you guys know. Secret Korahs that were hiding out that the Father exposes and reveals. Rebellion must be driven away from the midst of the covenant people of Yah. It must. Many will question why this person is there and why that person is there and why sh why is she doing that and why is he doing that? I've been here longer than them or hey, why is this or what? We should not be doing. We should be sensitive to what the Father's doing in our personal life and stay focused and stay uh, unified and allow the Ruach to move through those that the Father's raising up for specific things. Me? I'll tell you right off the bat, I can't do everything. There's some things in here many of you can do far, far more advanced than what I could do. And you're called to do those things. So each one of us has been called to do specific things. Rebellion is like a spiritual cancer that if it's not removed can destroy the in in entire community of people. It is. Rebellion is like a cancer that has to be removed. Would you guys agree with that? So let's look at this. I have a question. What was Korah? What was his problem? Two, two things we're going to look at. You have what's called the Torah Ra'ah, which is the, the, the law of being recognized. Every son and daughter wants recognition for, for what they do. They want to be ready. All of us in here, we want to be, you, you need you need in your spirit, man, and mentally, even, even emotionally. Every man and every woman needs some form of recognition. You want to make sure that you count and that you, you mean something. Every single one of us in here. Also, the Torah of Kavod in Hebrew or the Torah of honor. This was the root problem of Korah. These two things he battled with. He didn't accept the position of ordained leadership of Israel. Moshe and Aharon. They were handpicked by the father. Moses first and after the rebellion, Aaron was chosen and his sons for specific tasks. And we're going to look at a lineage in a second. If people can't recognize, listen, this is for you guys. Cannot recognize or honor who you are. If you know people that cannot respect and honor who you are in the body, why hang around with them? Why be around with them? For what? So they can keep suppressing who you are and who you are to become. No. Get away from them. There's no need to be around them. That's like bad fruit. Nothing is hidden that will not come to the surface. Everything that is suppressed 
and that is covered will come out in the open. Whatever isn't dealt with in your life will be manifested. If you're hiding something, if you're suppressing a secret life, or whatever it is, something big, something small, it will come out. Even if you say, you know what, that's too deep and that's too much, and I'm just going to run and leave it all, it's still going to come out in your lifetime. The scripture says, whatsoever a man sows in his flesh shall he also reap. We, our lives, become an actual harvest and planting season of our own. We can't hide. Occupying yourself with worldly things will only make everything worse. When it comes to Shabbat, I know this weekend you have the 4th of July. Many people are fired up and there's probably a few not here because of that. But what's more important, is Shabbat or the 4th of July? Even during the 4th of July, which we were celebrating the independence of this country, you had a very ugly slave system still in practice. So while those are celebrating the independence of this country, we need to ask ourselves today, and I'm not getting political, believe me, I'm not. We need to ask ourselves, is this still a free country or has it become a police state invasion? It's a police state invasion. You can't even use the restroom by yourself without someone watching you. So you might as well take your phone and everything to say, you know what, here you go. You're watching anyways. It's not a free country anymore. You have the hoof of Muhammad's horse passing laws every single month. That went over some of your heads. <laughs> The Torot of Ra'ah, Torot of Kavod, were the root problems of Korah. And we're going to see all of this unveiled right before our eyes. He didn't recognize and neither did he honor Moshe and Aharon, who were appointed and handpicked by Yah himself. And on your own time, you can read Romans 13, the whole chapter, and 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 22. Not recognizing the covenant Torah, and all its commands and not honoring Yahuwah's priesthood today will end up with a manifestation of rebellion again and it's already happening. It's going to happen. There will be an uprising of rebellion again. Korah, who was a Levite, is going to rise up again and say, wait a minute, you want to follow the Melchizedek? What? And we just read something from actual archaeological findings, yeah. history, documentation, and proof of the footprint of Melech Sadiq, who's been around for a long time, way before a Levitical priesthood that was chosen, and way before any sons of Korah. I'll tell you this, the Melech Sadiq priesthood is not worried about that stuff. But we will expose it and speak up against it and challenge it if it comes in our face. We have to. You have the Mormons defending it, but their whole view of it is wrong and tainted and mixed. Any Mormons in here? Mormons? We are seeing this rebellion playing forward in this generational time that we're living in on three different levels. Personally, in congregations, nationally, which will ultimately impact all of us globally. I want you to remember that. We're seeing it play out in a very powerful way that will impact us globally. That's why you see a lot of things happening right now. The Ruach HaKodesh has geographically assigned each and every one of us all of us are geographically assigned where we're supposed to be. Right here, if you're in here today, you were supposed to be here today. Right. And as you've come in here and you've been here for a while, it is your responsibility to allow the Ruach to cause your gifting to grow. It is not the responsibility of one person to hog up right here in the front and say, listen to everything that I have to say, I don't want to hear nothing you say. As many of you that know us here, this is open to the truth of His Word. So as you guys are stirred, you have something that the Father has deposited in your Ruach, which we have many men come up here. 
We've had a few women come up and almost start preaching. If you're moved by the Ruach and you do have something, you will be brought up here as His Spirit is moving through you. That's how the body grows. And that's how we transition. When we look at Omidbar chapter 16, verse 1 through 35, we have things that are still producing after their kind. As Genesis 1 was talking about, like kind produces after like kind. We have Korah who is seeking the high priesthood, and Dathan and Abiram who are looking for earthly carnality and temporary pleasures. Two different groups with two different plans and agendas, and they do hook up for a secret rebellion that is being manifested even today, you guys. We've talked about this like four or five years ago. A secret rebellion. Last week we showed how there was a secret society that was being created way back here during this time. In the scripture it says that Korah took right off the bat, and we're going to look at that. Hebrews 5.1, no one can take on the high priesthood. You have to be born into the Aaronic priesthood. You can't take it on like Caiaphas and all these guys. They're all liars. They're all Edomites, every one of them. They're all Herodians, Hasmonean descendants of Esau, all of them, every one of them. And today you have the same thing happening again. This is why one of the main discussions today is what's going on in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's like a watch. Everybody's watching, right? So we need to watch it, and that doesn't mean you have to fall for it because they set time in the wrong place. That's not what we need to look at for encouragement. That's what we need to look at for warning. Hebrews 5, 1 says, For every priest taken from among men is appointed on behalf of men in matters relating to Elohim to offer both gifts and offerings for sins. Korah. Verse 1 and 2, Korah, he rose up before Moses. Pride and ambition can easily give way to slander and rebellion. Pride and ambition. It's good to be ambitious, but when ambition is mixed with pride, rebellion will be birthed. Guaranteed. Yeshua said in Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the Malchut of heaven, of Hashemayim. And in Matthew 20, 27, And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. He's teaching of humility. The true Zadokite, the true righteous one, is one who will be a servant to all. Know when to get out the way. And know when to, to allow, the, to move out the way so that the Ruach, the Holy Spirit, can move through the vessel that the Father chooses for that time. How easy is it to become displeased with those who Yah Himself has chosen to be leaders and to fall into the spirit and sin of Korah? It's real easy to do that. Usually, I'll tell you this, the individual that wants the platform and is constantly pressing, I, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want to have my own assembly and I want to do this up in front. It's usually the guy that's not supposed to be there. Yah curses those who use their mouths to try and destroy divinely leadership. Read Jude, which we're, we're actually going to look at. And remember, Korah is a relative. That means he was somebody close to the system itself. And we're going to look at this. He was a Levite. He was very close. He was chosen. Because he didn't go with the golden calf system of worship. He stood with the Levites. We can really go somewhere with that. So even Korah, who didn't fall for the golden calf system of worship, it's because he already had another agenda. His whole thing, he was looking at the leadership position of Moses. And then that shifted, and it came down to Aaron as a permitted thing. So now Korah went from wanting Moses, which he still did in a sense, to what Aaron and his sons were given. So I'm going to tell you guys this. And you can tell, if you know any pastors, you can tell them the same thing. Just say, hey, you know... That there were many people under the blood of the Lamb in Egypt. 
that still died in the wilderness, even though they were under the blood. So you can still be someone who has come under the blood of Yahushua HaMashiach and still be killed and the earth open up because of rebellion. We can't hang on the seat seat on the side and say, I'm going to live how I want now because I received the blood once. No, now you have got to live according to covenant Torah for the rest of your days. Today in religion, you have a lot of people saying the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. That's all we need is Jesus is resurrected. He did away with the law. We can do what we want. No, the blood of Mashiach dealt with the death penalty position. And it gave us an opportunity to come back into fellowship with Yah, into His house. And once we enter His house, He says, Now I have a covenant lifestyle for you to live as you are prepared like a bride that was taken captive out of a battle. The battle was the sin of the world. That, and we were like that woman that was brought in from the outskirts that was afar off in him. And we were brought into the house and as we see the beauty of the house coming through the bloodstained door, we see that now there are certain appendages and, and things that I have to remove from my life because I see that your covenant is like a mirror. Your covenant is like water. And as that Torah portion then says that the woman would have her nails would be trimmed and her hair would be cut, her old person would be removed and she would come out after a whole cycle of time looking just like Israel because she began to live according to the covenant in the house of God in which the only entrance was through the blood-stained door of the Lamb. The prophet Ezekiel and the entire book of Hebrews informs us that the Melech Sadiq outranks Levi 100%. So we need to ask, should we expect to wit this type of witness to the same rebellion in the end times? It's going to happen again. It's already happening now. You have a lot of Hebrew roots, Messianic roots, really pressing hard with act with, with, with claiming and, and making these declarations that they are sons of Aaron, that they are Kohen, that they are Levites. We need to be weary of that. We need to really be weary of that. There's a big deception with that. Anybody hear anybody say that? You hear them. You guys hear them. You can be quiet right now. So look at Jude. For certain men have crept in unnoticed. Unnoticed. Why? Because they looked like everyone. They talked like you. They had beards like you. They had tzitzit like you. They even had the fancy tzitzits. And maybe even a couple keepers. Any keepers in here? My wife said I was a keeper. <laughs> who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our Yah into lewdness and denied the only Adonai Elohim, our Adonai Messiah, Yahushua, our Yahuwah, Yahushua HaMashiach. But I want to remind you, Jude says, those, excuse me, though you once knew this, that yod heh vav -He, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. You see that? Yeah. So you can't just say the blood, the blood, the blood. No, you've got to be one who has the testimony of Yeshua, the blood, and keep His commandments, His covenant, as the book of Revelation says. These dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know. And whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts in these things, they corrupt themselves. Woe to them. For they have gone in the way of Cain, become assassins with their words, and have run greedily in the error of Belam for profit, a false prophet that leads people away from covenant relationship, 
and perish in the rebellion of Korah, of Korah, wanting the priesthood position that does not belong to them, that is only given through Mashiach. You must be born again, Korah. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their lusts, and they mouth great swelling words. They might even know Hebrew real well. Flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Yahweh, Yahushua Mashiach. How they told you that there would be muckers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons. Anybody know any of those? who cause divisions not having the spirit. Someone who constantly tries to cause division in the congregation while the congregation is pressing on with covenant Torah and relationship with the Father is one who does not have the spirit of Yah. They have actually the spirit of anti-Messiah mixed. So here we had Korah. He took Vaikach Korah. Over 600 times that phrase, Vayikach Korah, is seen in the Tanakh. This word right here. It's a marriage term to take, but every time you see it, there's always the direct object present. And Abraham took Isaac, Vayikach Yitzchak. That's like a spitter. <laughs> but the direct object is always present. But here with Korah, it's actually missing. And we're going to see why in just a second. They gathered together against Moshe, verse 3 of chapter 16, and Aharon and said to them, You take too much upon yourself. We're getting to the point what he was taking. For all the congregation is set apart. Every one of them, we know that. And Yahweh is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of Yah? That's the first thing that will come out of Korah's mouth. One, hey, brother, you can't do all this by yourself. It's true. And next, hey, what makes you better than the next guy, man? All of a sudden, accusing you of something that you're not doing. This is Korah. What is the cause of this rebellion? The entire nation had just been sentenced to die in the wilderness and they will neither return to Egypt nor reach the promised land. Think about that. The whole nation was just sentenced to die in the wilderness in Shalach Lecha and Torah Koshen Korah, that whole generation is sentenced to death. So imagine the rebellion. It's like, what's the use anyway? Then forget it. If we're not going in, if the Messiah is not coming yet to take us, then let's just live however we want them. Because they want a physical thing first, rather than the spiritual thing, which should be altogether connected. Conditions were definitely ripe for rebellion against Moshe's authority. So Moshe reacts quickly to the rebellion with a miracle of judgment to prove the authenticity of his authority. Verse 28, And Moshe said, By this you shall know that Yodhevav has sent me to do all these works. He says this, For I have not done my own will. If these men die a natural death, then that means the Father has not sent me. But if, but if, Yah himself creates a new thing and the earth opens up and swallows them up, then you will know that these men did not have the understanding and that they have been rejected and that Yah himself has chosen Moses and have chosen Aharon. This is why we need to be very careful when we start individual. I say we as a whole, as a congregation and as individuals. We as individuals need to make sure we watch what comes out of our mouth. Lashon Hara turns into a serpent, a fiery Nachash that will wind up following you and, and, and eventually biting you right in the... <laughs> So here we have Dathan, Abiram, and On, which were with Korah, and they were all descendants of Reuben, but check this out. 
they would have resented Moses' leadership and they encamped to the south alongside the Kohathites and they were neighbors of Korah. So imagine all that. Reuben, it says, and we're going to read it, the firstborn privilege was taken from Reuben and it was given to someone else. So Reuben would, would have probably in his flesh, because he even writes in the uh, 12 test, in the Testaments of the 12 Patriarchs, he writes how he regretted what he had done. Yeah. And that a physical ailment happened to his body, his flesh. He had transact, he, he got some kind of a disease in his flesh. Proverbs 26, 18 says this, Like a madman throwing sparks, arrows, and death, so is a man who deceives his neighbor and says, I'm not joking. Seriously, this is what's going to happen. And this is what's happening. The fire goes out where there is no wood, so the strife ceases, ceases where there is no gossip. So if you guys... If you're around, if you're ever around someone, they start gossiping, tell them to shut up. Yeah. Say, shut up. Seriously, because that the father hates that. And you got people that are so, so driven by that. Woe to the wicked, woe unto his neighbor. The scripture is actually warning. So here's this vexing of Reuben. Reuben, the firstborn, has been replaced by the Levites and by the sons of Joseph. This is a vexation in, in Reuben, but he, he, he reaped what he had sown. He uncovered his father's nakedness also by sleeping with the wife. Korah was also a firstborn of the secondborn son, Itzhar. So he's going to have some kind of a problem because of his position and his coveting. Korah was seeking the priesthood and Abiram and Dathan, they wanted what? Carnal position, fleshly position, which is not going to be part of the nation of Israel. In this portion, even the upcoming days, Korah wanted the priesthood. The priesthood is the earthly connection to the spiritual world. And the priesthood is like a portal to heavenly things. If you guys will read the extra biblical scrolls, even when the Levites were actually offering up sacrifices, it does say in the scrolls, in the psalm scrolls, in the psalms of the Sabbath sacrifice, that angelic beings on multiple level temples were offering up the liturgy according to what was being offered up then. So Korah wanted this type of thing. He was being influenced by Hasatan. He was being influenced by the Satan. Period. Korah, look at his name. With just the change of the vowel points, you have kireach, which means to be bald, to be cold as ice, and it also means to remove plants from where they have been planted. So Korah's design is to do this. Hey, come over here. You don't have to stay there. Come on. Let's go to so-and-so's. Hey, let's go over here. Look what they got going on over here. Let's bounce around like plants. If you keep uprooting a plant, don't you guys notice the roots? The roots will begin to die. And it will cease to exist. Be planted. And let the Father cause you to flourish with all your giftings where you're at. And that's why when we started this congregation, the first thing that was impressed on my heart was, one, don't ever be a dictator. And two, don't you ever think you own anybody. When you have to go around on your tiptoes, right? And then run quietly back to some pastor or whatever. And pray that no one says anything to him because you went and learned something on a Shabbat. I would get the heck out of there. I would get out of there. Korah whispers in the ears from a distance exaggerated things that can cause you to become cold as ice like him towards the ones that Yah has connected you to. Korah is always after the leadership, period. 
it sets in doubt and you won't see it coming until it has taken residence inside of you. Korah goes after the appointed priesthood position. Aaron, Aaron Korah, but he didn't care. So let's look at Korah's actual name again. Korah means to be made bald and he comes from Yitzhar, the son of Kohat. He's a Kohathite, which is still one of the Levites, but he is not appointed to be in the position of Aaron and his sons. The first time Korah is mentioned is in Genesis 36 verse 5. It is a grandson of Esau. Look at the name. He was given the name. It's like who named him this? Knowing the descendants of where they come from and all this connection. The father of this Korah was Oholibama. Oh, <laughs> That's in the Torah. So first we mentioned about the hoof called Barach, and then we have Oholibama. Go oh, figure this. I don't know. It's, it's, all, it's there. Korah was one who became cold as ice and was the influence of rebellion, and he also brought 250 men with him. Korah's name equals 308. Let's see what he tries to uproot people from. One, here's where I've got it all mixed up. Where This was supposed to be like other slides back. But look at it. The kuf means to rise up. It's the wing. Resurrect, it means above. The resh is the head, beginning, leader, a mountaintop. The chet is a fence, a protected fence. A lineage means to separate, to cut off. So Korah's name means to rise up against the head of leadership and be cut off. And when you break down Korah's name like this, you have kuf ruach, the rising up of another spirit. Opposite of what Yah is trying to do in the life of the congregation. The rabbis mentioned that just as the Levites would shave their entire body of hair, Korah and these 250 men did the same thing. They were prepared to rise up as a priesthood of their own against the prescribed priesthood and they had a beautiful position. They carried the Ark of the Covenant. They carried the menorah. They carried the altar of incense. They carried the table of showbread. They carried the laver and the uh, altar of sacrifice. They carry these things. They were chosen, and look what happens when others try to carry those, they would be killed off. So they were chosen to carry these things, but it became a burden to them. A complete burden. 308 also equals two Hebrew words. Shuv, which means to repent. So Korah tries to keep you from making teshuvah. From making repentance. Korah will try to keep you. Korah's everywhere. He's all over the place. He'll tell you, ah, we're not under the law, we're under grace. That's one of the main big ones. It's like, go explain that to me then. We can go all day long with that one. Also, 380 equals Eleazar, which is a remez of not only the Ruach HaKodesh, but is one who watched over and was like the, uh, the judge over what, the, what Korah and all the other sons were doing when it came to the set-apart artifacts. He didn't like that. Torah 308 also gives us the Hebrew phrase, e kohen hagadol, which means I will give you counsel by the high priest. So he wanted to be high priest. He wanted to give counsel. He wanted to tell people what to do. And that's Korah. He wants to tell people what to do. Yatzcha comes from the word yaatz, which means to give advice. So he wanted to be the one to give advice. And taking it further back, Ya'atz comes from the word it's, which means trees. Remember last week, one of the things that just didn't fit, you had two opposites on the categories, and one of them, are there trees or not? Is there good advice in the land for you, or is there not? A tree will give us good advice. One of the very things distinct that Yahweh asks of pertaining to the land in Parsha Shalach Lecha, which is, are there any trees? So in essence, He asks, if there was good counsel, we can give advice, we can give good counsel on matters others don't know about. But when it comes down to it, you will either take the counsel or learn on your own, and sometimes the learning will bring heartache. We need to examine our life 
and see why is everything happening the way it's happening right now? What has transpired in my life? And begin to do what we can to come out of whatever it is that it might be hindering us. Generational iniquities are big. When it comes to community, we need to be committed to Yah and accountable to each other, especially in these last days. Because of the golden calf, we understand that a priesthood was imposed in the first place upon the nation of Israel because that's transgression. So now that Mashiach has come, we cannot rebel against what the Messiah has done. And see, this is why when we speak as a whole to churches everywhere and you tell them you have to obey the Torah, all of it, every single bit, sacrificial things, all these other things. No, we're to obey what the covenant of that Torah says that's woven in all over the place. We live by covenant. We don't need to be bringing animals for sacrifice. So watch out for those Korahs that try to sneak in and come against the hand-picked servants of Yah. Korah was a non-priest Levite. He was not a Levite. So I have a question. Are you a tree or just a piece of cut wood waiting to be placed in the fire to keep your enemies warm? Are you a tree bearing fruit or are you just some dead piece of wood that's going to be used in the campfire of your enemies? If you stay rooted and grounded, you'll be a tree flourishing. But if you keep bouncing all over the place, everywhere, and forsaking your immediate assembly, right? Because this conference or this thing going on, you know what? And they're all, there's an, a thrust, an influence towards a Levitical thing anyway. It's just like, why? Well, I stopped going to all of that. And notice how we've, we've gotten emails from individuals, hey, can we want to come down and teach against certain people. And I said, right now we're not doing that. We're not, because the influence will be mixed. So we've got to ask ourselves those types of questions. Fear kept the people from entering the land, and this week we see when fear sets in, rebellion is birth. It was an evil report, period which doomed that entire generation. When the fear of the world and man is embraced, it will give birth to rebellion in all forms of evil as well. Psalms, Tehillim 56.4, In Elohim I will praise His word. In Elohim I have put my trust. I will not fear what flesh can do unto me. Come on. Yeshiao, Isaiah 43.1, But now thus saith Yahweh, that created you, Jacob, Yaakov, and he that formed you, Israel. Fear not. For I have redeemed you and I have called you by my name. You are mine. I don't know about you. <laughs> fear of it. Yeah. Imagine that. He's saying you are Hallelujah. mine. You belong to me. Don't fear anything. You belong to me. What if a nuclear bomb goes off in Los Angeles? Who cares? Rock. You belong to me. Well, what if uh, the Arabs come and, and Islam begins to rise up in America? Too late. They're already doing it. <coughs> Who cares? Mm -hmm. You belong to me. Fear not. Well, what if I'm getting ready to get my head chopped off? Hallelujah. Fear not. Yeah. You belong to me. You receive the crown of life. Right. Well, what if someone takes my family and then begins to do all kinds of things to in front of me and it's this, this police state is going crazy now? Fear not. For I will avenge the blood of the righteous ones. Amen. You are mine. We have nothing to fear. Nothing. Isaiah 43, 2. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. When you walk in the fire, you shall not be burned. Nor shall the flame kindle on you. For I am Yahuwah, your Elohim, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, your Yahshua. I gave Egypt for your atonement. Ethiopia and Seba, instead of you, since you were precious, Segula, in my eyes, you are honored, and I love you. And I give men instead of you, and people instead of your soul. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your seed from the east, and I will gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and bring my daughters from the ends of the earth. 
everyone who is called by my name, and I have created him for my glory. I have formed him, yes, I have made him. Bring out the blind people, yet their eyes and, and, their, and the deaf, yet they are ears to him. Let all the nations be assembled and let the people be gathered. Who among them can desire this and cause us to hear former things? Let them give their witnesses that they may be justified or let them hear and say it is true. That is true. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's not done though. You are my witnesses, say Yahuwah, yeah. and my servant whom I have elected that you may know and believe me and understand that I am He. Before me there was no L form, nor shall any be after me. I, I am Yahuwah, and there is no Savior without me. Now I'm going to jump down here, and I can't interrupt his words. I declared, and I saved, and I proclaimed, and there is not a foreign Elohim among you. And you are my witnesses, says Yahuwah. Uh -huh. I am yeah. El. Yes, from this day I am He. And no one delivers from my hand. I will work, and who will reverse it? So says Yahuwah, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Who's the Savior? Yahushua. Who's the Redeemer? Yahushua. And who's the King of Israel? Yahushua. Who is Yahushua HaMashiach? Hallelujah. I have sent to Babylon and have brought all of them down as one flees, even the Chaldeans, whose shout is in the ships. I am Yahuwah, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. We can like close up right now. That's all I needed to hear. I was in tears when I was reading that. I said, I am putting this down. But let's ask, what is rebellion according to the Scripture? Are you guys ready? Yeah. The whole Torah portion is about this rebellion of Korah, the earth swallows one, the 250 are consumed. Levi winds up being chosen completely and placed, and now there's this position, all, all this stuff going on. It's really crazy. But let's look at this. What is rebellion according to the scripture? Not according to how we feel. Is it not going to Sunday service? No. Oh, you didn't go to church today? You're a rebellion, you backslider. <laughs> Nope. Not attending the Christmas or Easter celebrations? Definitely. Heck no. That's a definite no. Right. And the Mashiach has nothing to do with Christmas. Jesus probably does, but Yahushua HaMashiach has nothing to do with it. Just hear what I'm saying. Right. Or Easter celebrations has nothing to do with the resurrection of our master. Nothing. Zero. Nada. Not attending Wednesday night Bible study. Where were you at? I needed your tithe for my new truck. <laughs> Rebellion is exactly what Korah shows of usurping the authority of Moshe and prescribed priesthood and wanting to change the order of Yah. Today this is happening worldwide. We have genetic manipulation, replacement theology, alien embrace instead of fellow man being a priesthood manipulation and the Pope saying, hey, we're going to baptize the aliens, we're going to do all this stupid stuff. <laughs> Completely rebelling against his Torah. Which priests are you going to serve? The, Mel the Melchizedek or something else that's up to you? So let's look at this verse 1 from three translations because it's just, it's really big. The Institute for Scripture Research says, And Korah, son of Yitzhar, son of Kehat, son of Lui, took both Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, son of Pelet, sons of Reuben. The King Jimmy version says this, Now Korah, the son of Yitzhar, the son of Kohat, the son of Levi, Dathan and Byron, the sons of Eliab, and Bon, the son of Pelet, sons of Reuben, took, and it has an italic, italicized men. Because they're trying to make it make sense. It doesn't make sense. For the first time in 600 and something times of all Tanakh, this is like this. Korah, son of Yitzhar, in the Tanakh, son of uh, Kohath, son of Levi, separated himself with Dathan and Abiram. To be married is to separate yourself from the world and become one with your spouse. 
Mm. The man with the woman and the woman with the man. Nothing else. Not the animal and human being and not a man with a man and not a woman with a woman. That's not marriage. That's called abomination. So let's look at this. Genealogy. This is the genealogy. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Levi had three sons. Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. And from them they had their sons. Kohath with the vessels of honor. You have Itzvar here and here you have Korah and his sons. See that? Amram, Aaron, Mo they, this is the, the lineage. You see how it goes? I, I love these charts like this. I didn't make this up. I got it from the internet. So let's look at these three sons of Levi, Gershon, Merari, and Kohath, what they did. The Gershonites were responsible for the care of the Mishkan and the tent, its coverings, the curtain and the entrance to the tent of meeting, the curtains of the courtyard, the curtain and the entrance to the courtyard surrounding the tabernacle and altar, and the ropes and everything related to their use. So the Gershonites were responsible to guard and cover and carry the gateways into the Mishkan. They were guardians to the Mishkan on all the gateways and entrances. The Merariites were appointed to take care of the frames of the Mishkan, the support of the entire tabernacle, its crossbars, posts, bases, all its equipment, and everything related to their use, as well as the posts of the surrounding courtyard with their bases, tent pegs, and ropes. I think a couple weeks ago I had asked you guys to check out their names and look at what they are in charge of and you will discover some powerful things with these sons. Very key things in these last times. The Kohathites were responsible for the care of the Mikdash, the sanctuary. They were responsible for the care of the ark, the table, the menorah, the altars, the articles of the sanctuary used in ministering the curtain, the veil, and everything related to their use. And they were under the direct supervision of Eliezer, son of Aaron. So if Eliezer saw one of the children, one of the sons or daughters of, 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 of Korah, not carrying something properly, he would come and rebuke them. So they probably didn't even like that. They were bothered because they were out of line and someone who was appointed said, Hey, you shouldn't be doing that, brother. That's not, that's not of you. And you can tell Korah, but you know what? You can't tell me what to do. That's a Korah. But the Father places people in our life to help us so that we don't fall prey to sin and darkness. So look at I think the Kohathites were tired of lugging everything everywhere. They became weak. They became fed up. The Gershonites and the, mirror, the, the Mirrorites were allowed to transport the items under their care on carts, but the Kohathites had to lug their items around in the desert. They were lugging the set-apart things of the Mishkan on their shoulders. They were carrying the Levitical burden like many are trying to do today. Are trying, if you try to carry the Levitical burden now that the Messiah has risen from the dead, you're going to be burned out. It is going to implode on you. You're going to have to, listen, if you want to carry a Levitical burden, you will be drawn to the Talmudic influence of wickedness. You'll be drawn to that. You'll be drawn to the Mishnah and all the writings that are pretty powerful when it comes to how the sacrificial system works, but it's geared towards the Second Temple era. Not towards Solomon, even though there's an influence of that coming over. So the Mishnah's all geared towards Second Temple era, which was corrupt. Mm -hmm. So the Kohathites began to resent and despise this task and began to covet the role of the priest. So Korah was the grandson of Kohath, and he began the desert conspiracy with another group of Reubenite discontent men. They weren't content with the order that Yah had given. Namely, Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Pelet. So there was a total of 253 men along with Korah. In haughtiness, they roused a group of 250 men together to challenge the position of Moses and Aaron. In Hebrews 5.1, it says this, 
No one can take on the priesthood, for every Kohen Hagadol taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to Yorivave, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. And we know this is what happened. He is the one who can humble himself and have rachamim on the ignorant who go astray. For that he himself also is surrounded with weaknesses. And because of these, he is obliged to sacrifice for the people and also for himself on account of his own sins. Remember the high priest would offer up first. And no one takes his, this honor to himself, but that is called of Yah, as was Aaron. So this Torah portion, the position and the calling of priesthood, and now you're going to see that Yeshua is now compared and elevated both in position and power in this historical account. Thus is a rebellion against the lower priesthood, and it ended up with the scene in our portion how much more the rebellion against the higher priesthood that is seen in our Bashia. So let's look at this in Scripture. <clears throat> Scripture says this, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Psalm 2.7 As he says also in another place, You are a Kohen, Le'olam Ba'ed, after the order of Melech Sadiq, Psalm 110. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayer, tefillot, and supplications, was strong crying and tears, remember the Garden of Eden, to him that was able to save him from death and was heard, though he was the son, yet... He learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And having been perfected, right? Yeshua was always perfected. So this Greek word, look at it, is teleu, which means to bring things into its full meaning. He became the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Called of Yah, a Kohen Hagadol, after the order of Melech Sadiq, about whom we have many things to say, but some are hard to explain, as the writer says, seeing you are dull of hearing. So this is the same as today. The Greek word is nothros. I don't know if I said it right. You open up, they say it right? Nothros. And it means a shiftless person or a spiritless person. So for when by this time you ought to be Maureen, teachers, you have the need that someone teach you again the first principles of the primary writings of Yah. So we're going to identify this. The primary writings of Yah are found in gray sheet. And the primary writings that are being influenced from the book of Hebrews is found in Genesis chapter 12, Genesis chapter 15. These are the primary writings that are revealing this covenant relationship that Yah had made with Father Abraham. Verse 6, And have become those that are in need of milk, and not strong meat, for everyone that uses milk is unskilled in the word of tzedakah. And today you have a lot of believers that are still drinking the milk of the word. They're still having the same altar call, coming up to the altar, getting saved like 30, 40 times every year. Scripture says he's a baby. He's not even grown. The strong meat belongs to them that are mature, even those who by reason of using the word have their senses exercised to discern, to discern both tov and ra'ah, both good and evil. So only by using the word and looking at things in an objective fashion, listening to the still small voice and touching others and tasting his goodness, will you understand when we come into the common community of the people. We must set aside the Talmudic, churchianity, no disrespect, and rabbis to get to the Melech Sadiq meat. Otherwise, we risk falling victim to another assembly called Korachianity. I said, I asked my wife, should we do that? This is how, it doesn't look like that in the Tanakh, but this space is 
there should have been a word here after that phrase with him. Korah wanted everything for himself, as we had mentioned. Korah wanted the assembly. Korah wanted to be the counselor. Korah wanted to be the advisor. Korah wanted to be all these things. Korah was trying to assemble together a secret society. Like today, these secret societies are from a corrupted Jewish line that is really of the seed line of Esau. So when we look at verse 5 of the same chapter, we have Simeon and Levi, who are brothers back in Genesis 49, who have tools of violence. Remember this? And their weapon, which are their weapons of destruction. Tools of violence is actually the Hebrew phrase. Did I share this last week? I mentioned it. It's Kali Hamas, vessels of Hamas. Oh, yeah. This is what Levi works with, vessels of Hamas. And what did Jacob say? My soul is not to be entangled with the, that assembly that is operating like that. Mm -hmm. So the house of Jacob is not, to op is not to operate in this. So what was missing from this? The direct object after the Hebrew word Vayikach. And he took it. So we have an open space with something missing. Korah took the hearts of the people that followed him. He used smooth words and lured them away. He enticed them with a false hope of leadership outside of their ordained position. He cloaked them with his own ambition. He built a bunch of persuasion to become popular. So Korah was building his own little kingdom. He was attempting to build what we see in Exodus 19.6, a mamlechet koanim, a kingdom of priests, or from this kingdom of priesthood. He wanted the priesthood for himself, period. Korah didn't just take some men with him, but he separated himself from the congregation, that's how it happens. Someone isolates themselves and they begin to build up their own little thing without being accountable to anybody. We're supposed to be accountable to one another. That's dangerous stuff. That's very dangerous. So these tribes were all neighbors during the wilderness and you can imagine all the Lashon Hara. In Mishle 18.1, it says, He that separates himself seeks his own wisdom and contends against all sound wisdom. How many people have heard of the term heat boldedut? It's a term that has to do with prayer. To seclude yourself. So there's a time of going in seclusion so you can pray. But you don't want to seclude yourself from the assembly. You risk giving birth to something that is not set apart, that is not of God whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So it seems that Korah had no problems getting the support of Dathan and Abiram and On from the tribe of Reuben because they had already issues. This tribe also may have harbored resentment for Reuben had lost his firstborn position to Joseph. So the stigma of shame was probably still associated with that tribe. In 1 Chronicles 5.1 it says, Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, he was indeed the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the sons of Israel, so that the genealogy is not listed according to the birthright. So he was holding a grudge. And then we have mention of the 250 leaders from the various tribes. These men were likely also firstborn who had watched their priestly position handed over to the Levites. But Midbar 3.12 says this, now, now behold, I myself have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel instead of every firstborn who opens the womb among the children of Israel. So you see, it was a shift. It was a complete shift that brought about resentment. So let's look at this word that can, that for contends. It's the Hebrew word gala which means to break out in contention, to lay bare, to uncover, to continually expose one's self. So one who operates like a Korah will eventually expose their self continually. 
You can leave one place and they'll go to another place and you'll be exposed again. And you'll be exposed again and you'll keep being exposed again and again and again. And it's like never ending. The same meaning of our portion, Korah, meaning to make bare or bald. The wording is like this. Yitzgala, and the letters that are highlighted, means a potential future rebellion also. So the historical account of Korah is warning us as Israel that there will be another uprising of Korah that is going to take place. Rebellion is usually birthed while a person is isolated with another agenda. Where they stay away for a while, they begin to look at all these other things without having that weighed out according to the scripture. And then they come back with a hidden agenda and begin to try and do things in their own power. Korah separated himself with the seed of Reuben, who had the headship removed because of his sin. So maybe his sons held a grudge because of their father's failure and joined in with the conspiracy. And this is happening right now. Completely happening right now. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, it says this, Let no one deceive you in any way, because the falling away is to come first. And the man of lawlessness is to be revealed, the son of destruction. Now, I want to share this with you guys. In Daniel chapter 11, Shaul, Paul, is getting this information from the book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel chapter 11, verse 36 to 39, Daniel is prophesying about an Antiochus Epiphanes individual that has risen up who would wind up doing this very thing. So historically, Daniel was prophesying and talking about something that had happened, that was going to happen, and then it did. And when did that happen? During the Hasmonean era. So during the Hasmonean era, you have the Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth. You guys can look it up because this is a game changer, big time. When we can fix the flaws of history and put things back in the rightful perspective, we will understand a whole lot of stuff. And you guys know, this man rose up and he presented a lunar sliver moon observance called Rosh Chodesh to them. And he said, hey, what do you guys think about doing this? And the priesthood of that time said, no, 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 we don't, we don't take on what the Greeks are doing. So the sliver moon that's been embraced today, the Kararites came in and influenced that strongly within the rabbinics. And then the rabbinics influenced that for hundreds of years. And then you have many that have come out of Christianity into a, a messianic roots. And I think it was um, Mani Judas that when he first started, he says he could name off on one hand the only leaders worldwide within the messianic movement. It was very small, so it was not really that old. It was very new. So you had a lot of people coming out of the church and didn't know anything because of paganism and all that. They begin to realize Christmas is wrong and Easter is wrong and eating shellfish is abominable and eating pork is definitely wrong. So we begin to remove those things and begin to apply our, to our life, set apart things and, and observing the, the weekly Shabbat, right? Mm -hmm. And begin to make these transitions. And then when it came to the head of the month, I'm one. I was victim to it. We had Rosh Chodesh services. Right, Will? All the time, every month. <laughs> Looking for the sliver moon. And then I, uh, me personally, I started to look at the conjunction. And then the going away of the sliver. And then start doing some historical finds and research of scripture and evidence that the true system to follow is more of a priestly system, not a lunar sliver calendar deception that was embraced and influenced by who Daniel was talking about. Mm -hmm. What is the falling away that he was talking about? It's this apostasy, this rebellion. And so this rebellion will be those who willfully separate themselves from the truth and the relationship of Yahushua HaMashiach and all he has done by joining in with the same descendants as then, all desiring the priesthood status quo. And I think I might have mentioned this also before, maybe last year, I don't even remember when, but I know I mentioned it, that within the, the Hebrew Roots movement, you have already discussions 
of a Sanhedrin type council planned. How many people heard of that? How many people did not hear of it? They're picking guys. I'm not kidding. They've asked Rico. Rico's like, yes. You know, they can tell you. You know, they've asked other money, Judah, and certain individuals, a bunch of like big name guys that have been around for a while, right? To create like a messianic Sanhedrin council. And one of the main thrusts of that will be the push of the rise of the Levites. So just keep that in mind because we're living in these times. I can say yes. Exactly. Because when a Sanhedrin say what authority are they trying to bring that under? And that's the question. None. The authority that, that is being presumed is within themselves. But remember, Numbers 11, remember Numbers 11? From that point on of Numbers 11, Yah took the spirit of Moshe and he put it on 70 elders. Yeah. Men who were of high stature and responsibility and well respected. So it was those 70 and then Moses and Aaron. Moses was the prophet in the midst. From that point on and throughout history, whenever a Sanhedrin council was picked, it was picked from amongst the nation of Israel, but it was always a prophet in which the anointing and spirit of that prophet would be upon them. And there was always a seat for a prophet in the midst of the Sanhedrin council. That's why you see Isaiah in the courtyard of Israel rebuking them. That's why you see Jeremiah rebuking them. That's why you see Ezekiel being brought in to the second temple era. And Yah saying, let me show you the second temple prostitute. Mm -hmm. And we thought everything in the book of Ezekiel was a future thing to happen. No, he's rebuking the second temple era. Mm -hmm. He's saying, let me show you this prostitute up on this mountain. What she's doing. So all the prophets, all of them came and began to speak against this. So a true Sanhedrin council is to be handpicked and supervised by a prophet of Yah. Period. Anything else. So my thing is this. Is if anybody. You have that already in Jerusalem. With Rabbi Richmond in them. You have a Sanhedrin. Council there. That they brought up. But my thing is this. According to the Torah. Where's the biblical prophet. Who really hears from Yah. Who is one that does not play games. Because he would be rebuking everybody. Yeah. So you have these Sanhedrin Council influences now within the Messianic or Hebrew roots being planned. And then you have one already that has been put together in Jerusalem. It's all a big deception. The Father's going to raise up His prophets mm -hmm. and none of the prophets will be joining in with either one of those groups. Mm -hmm. I already know I'm like, some heat for that. I already know it, but that's fine. Verse 8 says, And Moshe said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi, is it little to you that the Elohim of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to perform the service of the dwelling place of Yah, to perform and set up all these, these holy and set apart vessels, and to stand before the congregation to serve them and minister? That's powerful. That whatever you set up, when Korah and his and the and the, uh, the sons all connected, when they were setting up the vessels, it's as if they were a reflection of those things also. How else could they minister? And that he has brought you near to himself, you and all your brothers, the sons of Levi, with you. And look at yet you seek the priesthood as well. That was the whole thing. Korah's objective was to try and win the priesthood for himself and for his kinsmen. So this secret society plan was hidden under the pretext 
that all the people were set apart and that they were equal. That's what's going to be transpiring and that's what's actually transpiring right now. So look at it. Once again, there's the genealogy for you guys. The genealogy of Levi and all the sons of Aaron. And there's a lot of details I have in here. I'm going to skip some stuff. people have been watching the news. I'm not talking about Channel 11 or Channel 9 or Channel 7 or Channel 4 or Channel 5. I'm talking about the good ones. The message. The good news. Yeah. The kingdom. The good news. Mm -hmm. Of what the Mashiach has been saying. This is what we need to be watching. Not what's on television. Because we're not going to tell you the truth. No. Whatsoever. Let me go back. Mm -hmm. In verse 10. Torah. He wanted the priesthood. So the agenda of Korah is exposed. Verse 11 says, For which cause both you and all your company are gathered together against Yah? And who is Aharon that you murmur against him? And Moshe sent to call Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, who said, We will not come up. And this is actually prophetic because they would not come up from the earth. The earth would swallow them and they would not come up. They prophesied their own doom. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of the land that flows with milk and honey? Who said Mitzrayim in Egypt was the land flowing with milk and honey? Look at the deception. Just like America, America is not the land flowing with milk and honey. The land of Israel is supposed to be the land flowing with milk and honey. The promised land that was given to Abraham. So they've twisted the words of promise according to the scripture. And in 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 16, Shaul in his letter, he's speaking in and of these things in which some things are hard to understand, which they that are unlearned and unstable, they twist to their own destruction. And the scripture goes on to say, you brought us up out to kill us in the wilderness, except perhaps to make yourself a leader over us. And I want to say this, in the end times, when a tribulation time does start, this is when the fire and the heat is turned up, this is going to prove and separate between, if I can say this, between the men and the boys. You will either run to the systems or you will trust Yah in the wilderness. You will run to all that the world has to offer or you will stay focused on what the Father is doing. Moreover, you have not brought us into the land that flows with milk and honey or given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Now they shifted. Will you now put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. And Moshe was very angry and he said to Yah, Respect not their offerings. I have not taken one donkey from them, neither have I hurt one of them. And Moshe said to Korah, You and all your company come before Yahweh with Aharon tomorrow. So what is amazing is later on there will be a very key person in Scripture, Samuel, that comes from Korah. And Israel's going to demand to have a king, and Yah's going to give them a king. Samuel's going to anoint the king privately, but later on, there's going to be a public anointing before Yah that's going to shift a whole lot of things. How many people are familiar with Samuel? The sages say that Korah paused in the midst of this and was shown in a vision that the prophet Samuel who would come from his lineage. So when the rebellion was birthed, through Korah, the only individual that did not join was On. Remember? His wife tells him to stay in the tent and follow Moshe. So sometimes, not all the time, 
We should listen to our wife. Uh. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you this. No man should be led around by the ear by his wife. No woman is to assert the authority of a man. In Deuteronomy 22 verse 5, it says this, that a man should not wear women's apparel. And a woman should not dress like a man. It says it's an abomination, either naturally or spiritually. A woman is not to put on the mantle that belongs to a man. The Father says it is an abomination. A woman is not supposed to lead where a man is supposed to lead. Not to belittle women. A woman has her place. A woman's more sensitive spiritually than us men. We got like dense skulls or something. And women have more sensitive hearts. But because of a woman's great sensitivity, there has to be regulation. So a woman should never lead the man. And there's, a, there's men like that. The woman leads them around like a little donkey. A man is to lead his family in love and obedience. So here we have these three men of influence. But you have Owen who does not. He does not come out. He stays inside of his tent. And he better be glad that he did. Yeah. So you have these three men. Aviram, Dayton, or Datan, and Korach. But look at the letters that are highlighted. It's, it's real interesting. So you have these three ultimately wind up pushing this rebellion. And grabbing the letter from each one of their names. Look at this. The Aleph represents power or an initiating force in leader. The Dalit is the door, the entrance beyond four dimensions that we understand. So this is always going to be a spiritual battle as well. The Kuf means to rise up. To, it's a channel of light, illumination. So the meanings of these give us the Hebrew word Adach, which means to attach, to fasten, to connect together. And their plan was to cause the people to disconnect from Moses and to attach themselves to this other priesthood which is happening during this Torah portion. And it's no coincidence these Hebrew letters is equivalent to the phrase La Kohen, which means to the priest. So Korah wanted the priesthood over and over. We can keep saying this. He wanted the priesthood. He wanted the priesthood. He wanted the priesthood. He wanted the priesthood. The, priesthood. the letters that remain give us Biram, which means pits, empty spaces and dimensions. The word Tan, which is a word for the beast or a dragon. And Ruach, and the letters in white, all the letters, look at just without even changing their letters. Right. Abiram, these letters we had earlier, but look at the letters that are left over. Embedded in them is the spiritual influence that we see today. And here's what it is we see today. I'm just going to say it. I've been holding back, but I'm going to say it. <laughs> so, that yeah. The entire Levitical thrust today, because it's a religious thing going on. It's always been about priesthood. Everybody wants this enlightenment and they want to come close to New Agers. You name it, Islam, die, and you have 70, 70 beds with 70, 72 virgins inside the bed. Like if that's that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You can't even, some of you guys can't even handle the wife we got. And you want 72 virgins in 70 beds. Are you kidding me? Solomon couldn't even handle all those women. Come on now, that's like foolish, it's dumb, it's really dumb. But this whole Levitical thrust, it's all about a priesthood, enlightenment, and this is what's being driven today, is being pushed and pressed and permitted and allowed hand in hand with what's going on in Jerusalem by the spirit and the Antichrist beast system, mm -hmm. the whole thing. Yeah. So when you bring this together, you have the spirit of the beast is the driving force that comes through the doorway of our four dimensions into this world. So the rebellion opens up the door to the spirit of the beast. And how do we know that? Look what happened recently with that whole satanic ceremony dance for opening up a tunnel. Naked people jumping around and doing all kinds of... It was, it was, it was disgusting. The earth would open up like a pit and swallow all of them whole. So when we add up, I like this, when we add up the numerical value of these letters, every Hebrew letter has a number, with their ordinal values, their positional numbers, we have the revelation of an end time connection. You guys want to see it? Yeah. And it's this. 
Genesis 6, 4. You have the Nephilim that were in the land and the earth in those days and thereafter. And this is what one of the thrusts are. You have the Nephilim influencing everything and they're going to be looking like priests in Jerusalem. So you have Nephilim being dressed up like Levites in Jerusalem playing the part and tricking everybody. It's the Nephilim system all over again. How do we know that? The book of Genesis reveals this same type of pattern. So after that, it can be read as end times. So we see this rebellion that rises up in the end times is actually happening now. A different priesthood is the focus aside from the Melech Sadiq righteousness. The potential of the Nephilim appearing again is due to the beast system that includes another priesthood. You need that, and it will be set up again in, in Jerusalem. It will be set up again completely in Jerusalem. But we know the city of David is somewhere totally different. In verse 12 of our Torah portion. I'll oh, go like five, ten more minutes. Number 16, 12. And Moses sent to call for Dathan and for Abiah and the sons of Eliab, and they said, we will not come up. So how many refused to come close to Yah? Dathan and Abiah and the sons of Eliab refused to make true Aliyah. What's happening right now? You have a false Aliyah that's being influenced in Jerusalem. You come and make Aliyah and you go through the yeshiva schools of the Temple Institute and you be conditioned to become Jewish. So I want to just tell you this, and a lot of you know this, a few of you might not. There's no such thing as being Jew-ish. That's an admittance that you're nothing. Are you a Yahudi? No, I'm Jewish. Oh, so you're nothing then. You're ish, kindish. Kind of. That's kind of like what it's saying. I'm Jewish. You're really nothing. You're not. You're none of it. So there's no such thing as Jewish. That's a that's a term that was at. You're either a Yahudim, you're an Israelite, or you're nothing, or you're not, or you're a nation. When we come through Messiah, there's no such thing as a saved Gentile, right? You're either part of the body of Mashiach or you're not. So to make Aliyah begins inside of us. Not the Aliyah of the rabbis, but the ascending up from this influence, the ascending up from the Korah and his mind control, ascend up beyond this rebellion, and they refuse the call of Moshe to come close. So Moshe represents the Torah, covenant Torah. And it is through the Torah that we discover how to draw near to Elohim. And Yahushua is the door, and it is by his blood that we can draw near. James 4.8 says this. Moshe was reaching out to them to ascend above the double mindset of this entire system. So instead, they refuse the prescribed way to come close, and they want to come up some other way of their own. And today, we see humanity, in general, refuses to ascend up by the instructions given to Moses, to Moshe. We can look at this whole Torah portion, and we can lock in on one thing, is the generation of Korah desires to ascend up and create a whole nother priesthood. Or we can take it even further. That this, that this generation of Korah is desiring to take on a Levitical priesthood hierarchy in these times that we live. 16.12 in Hebrew says this, Vaishlak Moshe, li kero ledatan ve la avra in Hebrew. Note the Hebrew letter Lamed attached to Moshe calling to Dathan's name and, the, and to Abiram's name, the Lamed. It means this, he was calling toward or for, in other words, he was trying to reshape their mindsets and give them an opportunity of repentance but they didn't want it. Just like in the Garden of Eden with Adam. For the purpose of existence we have the Lamed means to lead, to form in the way of the shepherd's teaching. The Lamed is an instruction guide for the obedient and a weapon against the rebellious. 
and it will shape you up or it will ship you out. The first the verse says, and he sent. So the he is Yahweh and the what is Moshe. So the Torah was sent to them just like the Mashiach is sent to us to bring about all the truth of the Torah, not to do away with anything. So the Torah can lead us out of rebellion. And he sent the Laman, but they refused it. They, he sent the shepherd, and the shepherd was refused completely. So we see they refused to be elevated into the ideas of Moshe, who was set apart by the Ruach HaKodesh and chosen back in Numbers chapter 11 as the prophet of Israel. And they refused completely. Acts chapter 3 verse 19. Repent therefore and turn back for the blotting out of your sins in order that the times of refreshing might come from the presence of the Master. And that He says Yeshua the Messiah pre-appointed for you whom heaven needs to receive until the times of restoration shall come. And we know that we're approaching this, this restoration that will come. In verse 13, I'm going to close most of here. Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of the, milk, the land of milk and honey? He twisted this and we know that Mitzrayim is not the land of milk and honey. In verse 17, And take every man his censer and put incense in it and bring it before Yah, every man his censer, 250 censers, you also and Aaron, each of you his censer. And they took every man his censer and put fire in them and laid incense on them and stood at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered the entire congregation against them at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the glory, the tiferet of Yah, appeared to all the congregation. And Yohebav, he spoke to Moshe and to Aaron, saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation, that I may consume them in a moment. It's kind of like Revelation 18, 4, Come out from among her, my people. And they fell upon their faces and said, O Elohim, the El of the Ruach of all flesh, Shall one man sin, and will you be angry with all the congregation? Remember Ezekiel 9.8. And Yah spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the congregation, saying, Move away from around the tent of Korah. Korah created his own tabernacle. It's a great apostasy that takes place, and it takes leaders to lead. Apostasy is actually the word for the harlot's wages. So the leaders will sell out the Messiah for money. And you know what that's called? I'm going to really just really hit it here. It's called becoming a 501 to three. It's selling the Messiah out for money. 501c3. And Moshe rose up and went to Dathan and Aviram, and the Zechanim, the righteous ones of Israel, followed him. So the On, the son of Pelet, he's actually absent. I quote this from the, from the actual Talmud for a reason. Sanhedrin 109b says this, His wise and righteous wife persuaded him to withdraw, saying he'd be subservient to either Moshe or Korah and having nothing to gain. That's actually words of wisdom. The tense of, of, of Korah is this, Lemishkan Korah, the tabernacle of Korah. He was trying to create his own tabernacle. Well, we're supposed to be learning from the tabernacle of Moshe. So Korah had built his own tabernacle and not just the tent of living. He created his own place of worship, recognition, and his own doorway to the spirit realm. He wanted the illumination for himself, and the Mishkan is a message of good news. So Korah was really preaching another good news by building another tabernacle. He wanted the, the serpent's anointing. And what is missing in this Hebrew phrase is the pointer of the direct object again, which is the Aleph. So just as our first two words revealed this removal, the same thing is going here all through the text with Korah. He is trying to create his own Mishkan. And can we say it? And I'm going to end with this. Can we say that the descendants of Korah are trying to create their own Temple Mount? 
and their own Temple Mount is in Jerusalem right now, a fortress that was built by Romans, and there's evidence for that. The whole fortress was something built by the Romans. There were big walls, and, and I'm actually reading evidence and archaeological things right now, and this is why this is so huge. Everything will change. We're going to go through a whole nother transition, and that's why you see there's been a few in here, and even outside, that pushed and fought against this and rebuking me for a lot of things because I was presenting the the influence of historical things of a priestly calendar that we're, we're touching on. But more than that, what's going on in Jerusalem and not submitting to the rabbis anymore. And some might say, well, the rabbi's been doing this for a long, long time. Why aren't we just going to listen to them? Because these rabbis are really not Yahudim. They're Ashkenazi Kara, uh, 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 Khazarians. Seeds of Esau that are very learned. The ones that are influencing. So we need to understand that right now what's trying to be built on the Temple Mount is the Tabernacle of Korah. Mm. The Tabernacle of Esau. The Tabernacle of Ishmael. Mm. You have the Dome of the Rock. Everything there. When everything else was torn down all around even after the, the, the battles, even after they put up the Dome of the Rock, that dome was still standing and re-fortified and all these things. So we need to be ready. Why? Because of this. And let me see if I can go ahead and close with this. I should have made my bell bow with this thing. Good word. Hold on, I want to close this. With this. Counting. With this, I cover the whole Torah portion, everything in it. Oh, we love it. Everything. So, uh, but I want to end. I want to end with tithing, you guys. Just kidding. <laughs> so, in conclusion, we leave you with the same scripture verse that we started with in the beginning of Prayer. One of them. Honor Yah with, with your substance and with your first fruits, and with everything that you've got, right? The rebellion of Korah was to drag the people into a dark and cold place. Everyone can do this thing as Korah said. Korah is like a goat which would lead the sheep, but in this case, Korah was trying to lead the people down the road of rebellion. And in these last days, the belly button of the earth has been removed. Python is present, and portals are open. So let us remove the rebellion of Korah and honor those whom Yah has placed over us as watchmen of our souls. Don't be a Korah who says, you put too much upon yourself, Torah teacher. May you all participate in our journey here at Remnant of True Congregation as we touch the lives of many generations without Korahs in the midst of the world. Press on, man and woman of Yahuwah, into the Malchut, the kingdom. And do you have a closed hand, or is it an open one for your brother and your sister? Yeah. Come on. Awesome. So just be, be warned that there is a, there is a big deception. A, a really big deception. Don't claim to be a messianic. Don't claim to be a Hebrew roots. Because ultimately, if you're Israel, you are not a Hebrew. Abraham was a Hebrew. Isaac was a Hebrew. Jacob was a Hebrew. They were the only Hebrews that crossed over. And because they did what they did, we become Israel. So in Mashiach, and yes, to a certain degree, we cross over from one from paganism into righteousness. Yeah, but we that's the that's the action of it. But when we complete the action, we come into the full manifestation of Israel. It's either Israel or it is nothing. Mm -hmm. 
the Mashiach only came for who? Israel. Yah says, the only nation that I love is Israel. That's wow. heavy and hard words to, yeah. to take in. So we can't claim to be Mexican and, and white, American, uh, no nationality, but the nation of Israel in Mashiach. So the people say, when well, I got people say, hey, what do we tell people when they say, who are we? Just tell them, I'm Israel. I'm the Israel of the Bible. I'm the Israel of the Bible. Yeah. The Melech Sadiq, under the, under the order of Melech Sadiq, high priesthood, Hallelujah. we are Israel. We, are, we can be found in scripture. And we have a heritage, we have an inheritance, and we are called the Segula. We are the precious treasure yeah. of the Almighty. Yeah. We are not of Korachianity. Yeah. We are of Israel. All right, so Shabbat Shalom, uh, you guys. We can all stand up. Hallelujah. And remember, we uh, we got to be locking up at, at 7 o'clock, all right? So we got time for fellowship and uh, and honing. But Abba, we thank you for your talk, for your instructions. And uh, Abba, we pray and ask that you would continue because this is a big thing going on right now. It is a religious war that has already begun. And the priesthood of Mashiach will be that which is the defining factor of all things. We don't need to defend Judaism, we don't need to defend Christianity, and we don't need to defend, for sure, Islam. What we need to do is walk in what your Torah says, your covenant Torah, and defend what it says when it comes to the 12 tribes of Israel. So we thank you, Abba, for all that you have given us and all that you're going to do. In the name of Yahuwah, Yahushua, Mashiach, Amen and Amen. Man. Hallelujah.